All right, welcome back to the second day of the state laws and your last day of class. All right, normally, uh, hey, that's how you. Normally, today would be picture day for you guys. Uh, we always get up in front of the class at the end and take a picture, um, but we'll probably bypass that today. All right, so let's continue right where we picked up our left off and pick up there at professional standard. Uh, by my calculations, I think this is where we are currently at. So here we go. Professional standards and incompetent practice. Uh, practitioners must comply in, in a professional manner and you must comply with all of these rules, all right? Now, letter A basically restates what I told you there in bold after a hearing, all right? So you can only be found in violation of these rules after a hearing, okay? So you just because you were arrested for free basin kittens in the real world doesn't mean that you are going to lose your license, or it doesn't mean that you automatically lost your license. You must go in front of the board and they must have a hearing and then they can determine if you're in violation. So if you have been practicing or engaging in fraud or material uh, deception, if you have been engaged in material deception in the course of your service, if you've advertised in a false or misleading manner, if you've ever been convicted of a crime that deals with fraudulent billing practices, I don't know why they selected that one out of there, but that's the one they did. If you have been convicted of a crime with a direct ability to practice competently or you are harmful to the public if you violate any other state or federal license law or rule that pertains to a license if you are licensed but you continue to practice after through professional incompetency meaning you're doing something that you have no idea like maybe dealing with a big commercial building that you've never done before. Um, if you fail to keep abreast of the current theory or practice, that would be your continuing ed that you have to do. If you fail to do your CE, you're actually in violation. It says any physical or mental impairment. Now here's a question that I have often asked myself, and sometimes I ask myself these things, and it keeps me awake at night. And when I talk to myself, I say, hey, self, because that's what I call me. I don't know what mental impairment or physical impairment, but here is a question to ponder. Obviously, under the Civil Rights Act and Fair Housing Acts, there is a law about discriminating people with disabilities. Now, I personally will tell you that I do not know of a licensed realtor. I don't know one that is currently wheel bound or in a wheelchair bound. So my question is, how does he show properties when he would go to a house? Like for instance, my house. I've got four sets of stairs. I've got the main level to the basement. I've got the main level to the second level. We've got third level stairs. You know, I, my house is not 80, is, it doesn't necessarily have to be ADA compliant. It's private residence. And if I don't discriminate on the buyer, but how does the agent show that property? I, I don't know the answer, Cameron. This is a rhetorical question. So I'm just trying to, I, I mean, I've said, thought that to myself. If an agent was to, sh if I put my house up for sale and an agent shows up to show my house, first of all, A, there's three steps to get up into my house. 
there is no ground level entry. And mine's, I don't have a ramp. I don't have a lift. So I've just, I've always wondered that. I don't know of any agents, but I just wondered how that that would impair their showing of ability. Um, if you have been addicted or abused any alcohol or drugs, I must, the assumption here is if you're caught practicing that. If you've engaged in lewd or immoral conduct in the delivery of services, all right? So this throws my joke out. I used to have a really good joke for this about no more nude open houses. But the reality is, have you guys seen on TBS, you know, they've got those naked and afraid and naked and dating. They actually had a series called Naked Real Estate. It was about a company that sold real estate in those nudist colonies in Florida. And it was a reality show and they were actually having a nude open house. So I guess lewd and lascivious is in the eye of the beholder as to what is immoral and what is lewd because this was actually on TV. I mean, it was kind of weird. They were all carrying around these little cloths and they'd set them on the chair. So when they sat down on the chair, you know, but it, it was called New, uh, Naked Real Estate. It was on TBS. <clears throat> um, if you have allowed another practitioner to use your license, typically you see this pop up when they say, oh, when a buyer says, hey, I'm real close to the house, just give me the code and I'll go in and then I'll call you or someone else tries to do your CE in your name. All right, number seven, if you've been convicted of a crime in a similar state that you have a license in, then you will probably be convicted here. If you've assisted another person in violating any of these rules, if you have allowed your license issued to be by to the board to be used by another, which we've talked about, and if you've engaged and knowingly cooperated in fraud or material deception to obtain your license, this is if you cheated on the exam or if you lied on the questionnaire, then those are all actual practices of incompetency. All right. Now, here's some other incompetent practices that I want to talk about. And remember the other day we did talk about the recovery fund and I said there actually has to be harm. Now, I want you to shift your mindset for this section because here there literally has to be zero harm done for you to get in hot water. This, these are actually punitive damages. You can be fined punitively, meaning a punishment. And let me show you the exact first one and you'll get what I'm talking about. You are committing a class A infraction if you fail to account for, remit any funds or lose documents belonging to others. All right, so listen to what I'm saying. If you lose someone's earnest money a check, you literally can go back to them and go, hey man, I lost your check, I'm sorry. I'll even pay the stop funds fee. Can you write me another check? No harm done. Wrong, that is a violation. That is considered incompetent practice. You can actually be charged with that by the Real Estate Commission. So there doesn't necessarily have to be harm for you to be in violation or for you to be practicing incompetently. If you accept an inducement for the purpose of attaining a sale, so if someone gives you a bribe or says, I want a commission, or I want you to give me some of the commission, you, if you receive an undisclosed profit, you are not allowed to make a bonus on a sale unless it's disclosed. You can make it if it's disclosed. I have been paid twice, two bonuses 
once by the listing agent, little old lady said, you know, hey, you guys did an extra special job. She wrote another $200 check. We put it on the HUD statement. Now it's a closing disclosure, but then it just netted out and came right to us as a bonus. What they don't want is you going out in the parking lot and your client going, hey, thanks for the help and, you know, give you an extra bonus on it. Unless, of course, it's cash, and that's completely different because you can't track cash. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So don't receive any direct uh, bonuses, uh, bonuses. Four, don't act as dual capacity. Now, they mentioned the word dual here instead of limited because this is an Indiana code which applies to all licensees across all the commissions. So that's why they're using the word dual. We only use the word limited in real estate. So don't act in dual capacity without an undisclosed client. They have to know that you are a limited agency. Uh, you cannot list a property without the written consent or on any other terms than that is authorized. So what I'm telling you here is if your seller says, I want to sell the house, you would list the house for sale. You cannot list it for lease. You cannot list it as a land contract. You cannot list it as an option. You can only list it on the terms that your seller has agreed to provide. That does not mean that you cannot receive an offer on other terms than what you've listed it. Because I have no control over what you guys do with your client. If I have a property listed for sale, you in theory could call me up and go, hey, my client wants to lease the property for a year. I would in turn say, you know, if you write the offer, I'll give it to my client because that's what I'm supposed to do. But I didn't market it for lease. All right, that's the violation. I can receive offers, doesn't matter because it's just an offer. But my professionalism says I cannot market it in other terms than what he wanted. Seven, you cannot induce a part, party to a written contract to breach that contract for the sole purpose of getting to another contract, all right? So if you've got a purchase agreement and it's accepted and you get another purchase agreement in, you still, A, have to show it to your client, but B, you better tell him, dude, I understand that this one is $100,000 more but remember, we are under a legally binding contract already. We cannot violate this contract just to get to that better one. Because if we do, I am violating my ethical rules. Now, if this original contract fails to close or they miss a deadline, then sure, we can get rid of them and come to the new one. But I can't breach this contract intentionally to get that to that one. Number eight says, I can't accept a listing based upon a appraisal report at a predetermined value. I cannot tell you, hey, I'll list your house, but it's only, only if it's a hundred grand. I don't list those low end houses. That's not correct. Nine says, I can't issue an appraisal report on my own property. Remember as a broker, I can appraise, I'm not supposed to do that. Uh, 10, 10 is what I like to euphemistically call the punch in the nose rule. All right. 10 says <clears throat> you cannot solicit or even negotiate an agency agreement with a client. If you know that client is already another broker's client. So in other words, I can't come to some seller and go, Hey, I know that you've listed with Billy Bob, but I'm cheaper and way better. Come over, dump him and come to me. No, I cannot talk to another agent's client. 
Plus, I get probably get punched in the nose if I do. That's why I call it that. You cannot represent or attempt to even pretend you're representing more than one Indiana broker company at a time. You cannot pay a commission to someone who is not licensed. You will see this a lot. You will get a friend of yours that will call you up and go, hey man, I got a friend of mine that wants to buy a house. I'm going to give him your name, but I want you to give me a finder's fee for giving you the name. You can't do that. That's a referral or a commission. You are not licensed. I cannot give you that. You cannot commit any act of fraud or material dis, uh, deception while engaged in the acts that require a license. You cannot otherwise violate any other rule that we haven't mentioned because ignorance is no excuse in the, of the law. And you are the finally, if you have been uh, unlawfully or if you have been determined to have unlawfully discriminated, in your practice under the Indiana Civil Rights Act, then you too are practicing incompetently.